the subset of RASVA mutated translocated lung cancers is a very important subset. It's a small percentage of our patients, maybe just 0.5 to 1%. But this particular patient subset uh, derives tremendous benefit from targeted therapy. And now we have different generations of agents to offer. So to identify these patients is absolutely critical. So to integrate RAS testing into your platform is an absolute must and cannot be you know, forgotten. What is the proper test? Well, there's different tests that we can perform nowadays. Um, the most commonly used platforms are either FISH, uh, looking for you know, the very specific translocations, uh, or next generation sequencing technology. And the latter really allows us to actually do multi-gen testing at the same time. So allowing really just to complete molecular testing in you know, one setting in a way. IEC testing is uh, also under development. It's not as good as for ELK. Uh, for ELK, IEC is very reliable. For us, we're not so confident yet. So usually it's FISH or NGS testing that your institution will want to integrate into the molecular testing paradigms with NGS having a very specific advantage of allowing kind of a one-time shop, you know, for molecular testing with one single test integrating all the molecular needs. Of course, you know, you can have translocations that do not yield the functional protein, but that's unusual. So when you see a RAS translocation, you have to, you have to think that this might be an actionable alteration and the largest majority of those are. Um, of course, testing companies will do their best to make sure that the information is uh, relayed in an appropriate, appropriate fashion as to um, the reliability of detection, was the translocation direct, uh, detected in both directions, et cetera. Uh, but most of the time when we see a RAS fusion detected, that's an actionable abnormality. I'm most commonly seen in lung cancers, but can be seen rarely in other cancers as well both cholangiocarcinomas as well as certain CNS malignancies. So it's important to know about RAS translocations, RAS fusions for other settings as well. Just like with EGF and ALK, you know, there are certain subsets of patients where these abnormalities are enriched, usually younger patients, non-smokers. With EGF mutations, there's a gender predilection as well for, for females. That's really not the case for RAS or ALK. The gender balance seems to be about 50-50, you know, but at the same time, you know, tends, tends to be younger patients uh, with adenocarcinoma um, histology. That being said, there's always a certain percentage of patients who are smokers, who are elderly, actually sometimes even you know, non-adenocarcinoma histology. So the best is not to use the phenotype to drive testing, but to make sure that all of our advanced non-small cell lung cancer patients get appropriate testing at the end of the day. In terms of the standard of care for ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer, um, you know, to my mind, uh, for metastatic ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer, um, my first line treatment is, is a ROS1 TKI. And that could either be crizotinib, which as mentioned, has a, has a median progression-free survival of over 19 months in, in the pivotal trial, has a response rate of about 70%, uh, and intrectinib, uh, which was recently approved for ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer, um, that has additional CNS activity. So that's a consideration, particularly in patients uh, with ROS1 rearranged non-small cell lung cancer that have uh, CNS disease, its duration of response was in excess of 20 months in, in the pooled cl clinical trials with intrectinib, looking specifically at ROS1 rearranged non-small cell lung cancer. Those are the preferred agents. Um, Seritinib has also been looked at, has, has some activity, but really unclear if it's any better than crizotinib or, or intrectinib, and I don't think it's been studied as extensively in ROS1. Lorlatinib and subsequent lines of therapy also appears to have some activity. Um, and, and there's clinical trials with additional agents such as repetrectinib uh, that, are, that are particularly of interest. Um, I would also mention that beyond ROS1 TKIs, uh, penetrexid-based therapy like in ALK non-small cell lung cancer, ROS1 non-small cell lung cancer does appear preferentially sensitive uh, to penetrexid-based therapy as well in terms, of, in terms of chemotherapy combinations in the future. But my, my initial approach is, is a ROS1 TKI first based upon the extraordinary PFS benefit observed with um, crizotinib and intrectinib. As I mentioned in my prior talk, um, it is best to hold your treatment uh, until you know that your patient has ROS rearranged down small cell lung cancer. There are several agents which are currently available in ROS rearranged down small cell lung cancer. The data 
behind efficacy of immunotherapy in that population is actually quite limited. Um, the only thing we have is a retrospective uh, registry, which is called immunotarget. Um, in that registry, patients with ros range lung cancer were given immunotherapy, and response rate was only 16%. Um, and 83% of the patients with ROS rearranged lung cancer progressed on um, immunotherapy. Um, we also know that PDL1 expression um, in patients with oncogenically driven tumors can be falsely elevated and does not necessarily predict um, efficacy of immunotherapy in that population. So that's why. I would wait for the molecular testing results, and I would like to treat ROS rearranged patients with oncogenic driven therapies and do not use immunotherapy instead of targeted therapy.